Welcome to all you steadfast and resilient Hurley Burleyites. I'm happy to report based on personal feedback and what the media reported that you either loved or were totally freaked out by my conversation last week with OSFI Chief Peter Routledge, which is exactly what we strive for here at the Hurley Burley, some kind of strong response. We try to beat back the bland on this show. We're anti-meh. And with that, I'm so excited to welcome this week's guest, the Honorable David Lametti, Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Minister Lametti was first elected as MP for La Salle et Mar Verdun in 2015 and served as Parliamentary Secretary until some events in 2019. Prior to entering politics, he was the Professor of Law at McGill University and served as Associate Dean of the Faculty of Law for th at McGill for three years as well as a member of the University's Senate. He holds degrees from the U of T and McGill, as well as a Master of Laws from Yale Law School and a Doctor of Philosophy and Law from Oxford University. A well-educated man. We're going to talk broadly today about Mr. Lametti's agenda for the Department of Justice. How does he see the role of the department in a world as divided as this? What's his view of the convoy protest, both what it represents and how best to deal with it? We're going to talk about Bill 21. We're going to talk about his Indigenous agenda. And anything else we can squeeze in, because there's so much to talk about with Minister Lametti. It's a real honor to have you here. Minister, thank you for coming on the Hurley Burley. Great to be here, David. Thank you for having me. Hey, how are you? I'm good. You know, Where are you and how are you? It's a stressful you? time. I'm in Montreal. Uh, okay. it's, it's a, uh, so I'm at uh, my home in Montreal and uh, working at a distance this week. We're, we're, we're one week on, Minister's one week off, so one week virtual, one week physical presence and so I was on physical presence last week and I'm virtual this week. So I know you to be somebody whose musical knowledge dwarfs mine. So as a sophisticated connoisseur of music, what are you listening to these days? Uh, generally uh, sort of soft, uh, softer Canadian uh, and female stuff. So uh, the weather station out of Toronto, uh, but also the new Fleet Foxes album, uh, the new the new War on Drugs album from last year is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it is good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I still listen to Big Red Machine from last year, which was a, a, a collaboration, uh, and and again, great great piece of work. Fleet Foxes, eh? I listened to the first one of their albums. It didn't uh, didn't grab me. It, it, you got to be in the mood. Um, these days, I'm just using it to wind down. <laughs> When I when right. you know when when I when I'm using it to wind up, then I'll go back to sort of '80s uh, '80s punk or '90s grunge. But uh, but, uh, <laughs> but when it's uh, late at night, I usually have something mm -hmm. soft on. A lot of Phoebe Bridgers, Lucy Dacus, uh, people like that as well. Oh yeah, those are well Phoebe Bridgers. I've been with for a few years, but Lucy Dacus was one of my big finds of this last year. That was oh, it's great, great. If you go back and listen to Better Better Oblivion Community Center, uh, which was a collaboration between Phoebe Bridgers and Connor Orbst of uh, Bright Eyes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then, and then uh, Phoebe Bridgers has done a fair bit of collaboration with Lucy Dacus uh, and Julian Barnes, and all of it's good. Whatever happened to Connor Orbst? Where did he go? He's back. He kind of kind of disappeared for a few years, but he's back. Apparently, he's recording a new album, uh, and something will be out soon. Interesting. Cool. Okay, so... How did you wind your way to being the Minister of Justice, Mr. Lametti? What is your background? Where do you come from? Well, look, my, my parents were Italian immigrants uh, to Canada with no formal education. Uh, the only thing they what wanted What part of Italy did they come from? From the middle, Le Marche, some of the marches. Uh, if you okay. put a pin in, in the middle of a dead geographical center of Italy, you'll get really close uh, to where my parents came from, in the, in the Apennines. Um, they settled in Southern Ontario in Port Colborne. Uh, I grew up there uh, and all they wanted us to do was get an education, which, which uh, my, my brother said I exaggerated a little bit, but it's okay. I'm happy where I am. <laughs> and look, this is, this is a testament to Canada. Um, and the fact that we have, I would say a really open education system that allowed me to go to U of T and McGill and then allowed me to go study abroad uh, with financial support. Um, I wouldn't have had that opportunity had I stayed in the middle of it. And that irony never escaped me when I was going back to Italy to lecture in, in, 
in uh, Italian law faculties and, you know, Italians love titles, so it's professore, dottore, and all that stuff. It, it never, the irony didn't, it wasn't lost on me that had I had my parents remained in Italy, I would not be lecturing in that, you know, and, you know, at, at one, of, one of the leading law faculties, a number of the leading law faculties across Italy, which is what I did. I could speak Italian, so they, they always invited me. Um, and then I, you know, I, I landed. Is that uh, your mother I landed tongue? At, it is my mother tongue. Uh, I still speak it and I still taught my kids. Mm. So I'm pretty proud of that. The, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, I landed at McGill and uh, it was where I'd studied law. It was where I was comfortable. Uh, a number of my mentors were still there when I got, when I got back. And had a great gig. Um, enjoyed it. Uh, was generally really happy. Uh, except with the Harper government. Uh, and, and at a certain point, I got tired of it and uh, said, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring. And I thought, uh, I'd, I'd been associated, as you know, uh, with the Liberals way back when we were young Liberals in Ontario, David. Um, but uh, I had left the party in, in the 80s when there was a fair bit of infighting. And, um, and so I came back to it and thought this was the best vehicle to, to try to dislodge the Harper government. Threw my hat in the ring in a, in a part of the world you're familiar with uh, because it's Mr. Martin's part of the world. And uh, he's been great, by the way, supporting me. And, what is uh, it with that riding? What What is it with that riding in downtown Montreal, wanting to elect guys from Southwest Ontario? I, I don't know. I don't know. And, and from <laughs> opposite ends of Highway Three, right? It's the, the Martins for you know, one end of Highway Three is Windsor, the other end of Highway Three is Port Colvin, Fort Erie, which is where I was from. So, oh well. So there we are. Got elected. Um, got a nomination. Uh, got elected, and uh, here I am. Did Trudeau recruit you, or why did you run in 2015, say, instead of 2011? 2011, I was still in the middle of, well, 2011, I was also on sabbatical, uh, when I, and I was in Italy for that year, so uh, it wasn't really an option. Uh, in 2015, I was really tired of, of the Harper government, the attitude that it had towards the environment, towards academic expertise, towards criminal law. And, and I thought, it's time. It's, it's a good moment for me to be thinking about a change. Uh, and it was, and it ended up getting lucky. I thought, I thought in 2015, maybe I was running for later uh, because I, I wasn't well known uh, in party circles in Montreal. Um, but everything worked out. And here I am. Yeah. So as you mentioned, like me, you got involved in politics when you were in high school. Why did you do, what brought, what, what drew you in? What, what, what was the attraction? Well, look, I was, I was a, an immigrant kid um, growing up in an immigrant family, and, and Pierre Trudeau was a hero. Um, and that, that, vision, uh, that vision of Canada that, that uh, Pierre Trudeau was building at the time, um, it began with, with policies on multiculturalism and, and the just society and, and pushed us towards the charter. Um, all of that was attractive to me. And so I got involved. Um, uh, heavily involved and and uh, had a lot of you know had a lot of uh, really positive moments, um, and and continued I think to have a great deal of respect uh, for for politics um, and public service. And I one thing I I tried to do in my teaching it's easy to be cynical as a law professor, but um, I tried not to denigrate. Uh, public servants um, and and politicians because I knew that they were working hard and, and trying. Got a little tougher with Harper <laughs> in the end, you know, towards towards right. uh, 2012, 13, 14. But but I, I did try to be respectful of that of that vocation. Right. So, you know, let's get let's get to what's probably on people's minds, Minister, which is we're kind of two weeks into the siege of Ottawa. What are you thinking? We've got a right to protest. I know that, but this is this has gone beyond that. People have made their point. We're all frustrated uh, with uh, the pandemic, and we're frustrated with restrictive measures during a pandemic. Um, as a government, we've said we're going to constantly review that based on the science. So people people have come up. They've made their point. They felt they weren't being heard. They've made their point. But now this is a, this is an occupation. It's a siege, as you said, and the people of Ottawa, in particular, are feeling it. Um, residents uh, of central Ottawa and, and other parts of Ottawa, uh, businesses, the Rideau Centre has been closed for 13 days. That's like 1,500 people who have not worked 
uh, for 13 days because of, because of all this. Um, this is, and, and the noise, other, other um, frankly, forms of, of, of uh, psychological harassment, like the horn honking and that sort of thing, um, it's time. It's time to go. Uh, we're going uh, to continue to govern listening to people. We're going to continue to govern listening to experts. Um, and you're already seeing some restrictions being being lifted at the provincial level. Most of the most of the restrictions that are being complained about uh, generally are at the provincial level, and they're they're beginning to be uh, lifted as as the pandemic evolves, and and we're open to that. So it's it, really it's time for people to go um, and uh, and allow Ottawa to get get its life back. When you look at the support that the protest has in the country, the polls are showing it pretty consistently around somewhere between 30 and 35 percent of Canadians uh, identify with the protesters. Probably means more people have some level of, of interest in the protesters. Do you think it's indicative of anything larger? Is it really just about vaccine mandates and lockdowns during COVID? Or is this an indicator of some other schisms that are in our society? Well, I think for the vast, vast majority of that percentage you've cited, David, I, I think it is frustration with the pandemic. I think it is the mandates. It is the lockdowns um, and the cumulative effect over two years. I mean, we, we've gone through a roller coaster of waves where at the end of each wave, we think it's going to get better and then, and then it doesn't. And, and Omicron in particular hitting when it did over Christmas time at a point where we had seen uh, a, a reopening, a bit of reopening uh, across Canada in various places and spaces, and people began to, you know, really live their lives again in in, in ways that they hadn't been able to for a year and a half. The timing of, the, of all that was bad. It's in the middle of winter. Uh, Canadian winter is tough to begin with, uh, you know, everywhere except sort of Victoria, and um, and all that all of that accumulates. And so I think most of it is that um, there are some. Look, there are. Some other movements happening. We've seen links to, to you know, movements in the United States and, and events down there. So I'm not going to deny that that might be part of it too for some people. But I do think that for the vast majority of people, it is about being sick and tired of this pandemic and really wanting to move on and, and expressing what is a hope or a desire to move on through uh, this kind of this kind of protest. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, speaking of these protests. Didn't you pass a law that made it illegal to harass or bully healthcare workers? Yes, we did. Did that last uh, yeah. last fall? Uh, it's up uh, once we passed. And didn't it, I hear? Have, didn't I? Didn't I hear did health authorities? Didn't I hear health authorities this past week telling healthcare workers not to wear any clothing that would reveal that they were healthcare workers on their way to and from work? for fear of being harassed or bullied. So is that law not being enforced? Well, it's up, it's up to the police to enforce it. The, the, the incident you're referring to is happening in central Ottawa. And uh, there is a group of protesters in that area. Um, it, the police have to enforce it. And then the, the prosecution service, uh, in this case, generally the provincial prosecution service, the provincial crown has to, has to take that information and charge and, uh, and, and, and lay charges. Um, or, or prosecute the police lay charges and, and the prosecution service moves. Now, we're we're encouraging uh, we're <laughs> encouraging. I'm going to put that in your air quotes, given your uh, given the title of your, your production company. Yeah, uh, we're encouraging the police to uh, take matters in hand. They have all the laws they need uh, to to uh, react uh, to the situation on the ground, and that is one of them. Right. One of the most pressing, I would think. It would seem to me, you can only call your abdominal muscles abs if they're visible. And mine are so not visible. I haven't really used them in the last eh, 20 years. And so Hurley's abs are lost beneath layers of burly. Use it or lose it. That principle is at the heart of this next part of the story from our presenting sponsor, TELUS on how to get high-speed 5G wireless connectivity right across all of Canada. Not just the big cities, 
but all rural, remote, and indigenous communities. This is Chapter 4, Search and Deploy. Right now, the feds are holding public consultations, searching for the answer to this question. What's the best way to auction licenses for a new, critical, mid-band of 5G spectrum, which can carry reams of data over very long distances and will make connectivity so much faster? TELUS believes a 100 megahertz CAPS policy is the way to go because it means four different carriers will have enough of that spectrum to launch their 5G networks equally in every market. They'll have to compete aggressively on service. Good for all of us. But deploying that spectrum in a timely manner is just as big an issue. And here's where the policy of use it or lose it applies. TELUS believes that carriers who buy the spectrum should be mandated to invest and use it in all markets, especially rural, or else the government should have the ability to retract the licenses. The facts are these hurly burlyites. In previous spectrum auctions, there was a 20 year deployment window. 20 years! It's led to spectrum squatting, which works like this regional carriers buy the spectrum at a steep discount. Then, in rural areas, they barely deploy it, doing as little as possible in order to hold on to it before reselling it at a massive profit. So they're not actually using the spectrum. They're gaming the system at the expense of Canadians. It's the prime reason so many rural, remote, and Indigenous communities don't have the high-speed connectivity they need right now. The stakes couldn't be higher. Faster deployment of 5G to every single Canadian household is going to help us keep up with the rest of the world in our innovation economies as we emerge from this pandemic. Lots to chew on here, and you can have your say in the process by going to telus.com slash get5gright. Okay, so uh, I read your mandate letter. I read your mandate letter. It's really activist. It's really, it's really activist. Long. It's really long. Um, and it, it uh, uh, well, what are your priorities out of it? I mean, I, I know that you're supposed to do all of it, but what, what, what are your sort of got your teeth into right now? Well, I think let me let me divide that. Uh, let me divide that into two um, because I think the government the government priority, the overall government priority you see from the preamble and the mandate letter is reconciliation. And so a number of you know a number of different points in that mandate letter refer directly to that reconciliation agenda. So implementing under it. And, and doing it with uh, Indigenous peoples, because that's the principle of UNDRA. Um, uh, working through uh, the Indigenous justice strategy and trying to address the, that huge problem of, of over-incarceration of Indigenous peoples and the way in which they, they have contact with the criminal justice system. But part of that's me, part of that's with Mendocino on policing uh, and, and, and Indigenous partners all the way through. Part of it is, is a special interlocutor as a way to help, help um, help Indigenous communities that have uh, had direct contact with the res residential schools tragedy and, and now the, uh, the findings of unmarked graves, uh, helping them to get through it and establishing a better, I like to say normative framework because I'm a geeky prof, but um, uh, establishing a better set of rules, really, uh, and practices in order to, to help those communities deal with it. Uh, Second, I, second order of things, I suppose, is, is fixing the criminal justice system. Again, there's over-incarceration of Indigenous peoples, but also Black Canadians. So part of that is the minimum mandatory penalties bill that I've got in front of the House right now. Part of it is other investments like community justice centres that help um, keep people out of the criminal justice system. Uh, and, pretend and I'm a dumb minister. If I can interrupt you for a second. Pretend I'm a dumb guy, a dumb white guy from Regina. And tell me, why do mandatory minimums um, uh, discriminate against Indigenous people or people of color? Well, they're, they're uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, um, it is simply statistically true that if you're a Black or Indigenous person, you're more likely to be stopped by the police. If you're a Black or Indigenous person, that stopping by the police is more likely to lead to you being taken to the station. If you're a Black or Indigenous person, 
again, it's just statistically true that 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 visit to the police station will end up with you being charged. And it is also statistically true that it's more likely that you will be charged with an offense carrying a minimum mandatory penalty. Once that minimum mandatory penalty gets applied, then you're in the criminal justice system. And, and it is, it leads to less plea bargaining. It leads to more incarceration rates. Um, people will then always plead innocent, even when they might have pled out on something on a lesser charge. Why? Because the only way they can, they can try to do this is to, is to launch a charter challenge against the MMP. 50% of all the charter challenges in the Canadian criminal justice system are of MMPs. We talk about Jordan rulings and clogging the system. They're, they're having a major impact clogging the system, but that's another thing we're trying to fix. In this case, just uh, keeping people out of the criminal justice system for really minor offenses uh, or offenses which, in which the problem is something else. So you get, the, the, you know, one of the classic cases, and, it, and you said Regina, so I'm going to say Saskatchewan, where I think something like 70% of all the women incarcerated are Indigenous women. And a lot of them are there because of problematic abuse, substance abuse. And so they're, they're selling off some pills in order to, to uh, feed their habit, as it were. This isn't the kind of stuff that should land somebody in jail for four years. This is the kind of stuff that should help that where we should find another health based solution to, to solving the problem. And so all we're doing is we're hardening criminals, hardening people, putting them in in um, in prison for these minimum mandatory penalties. We're clogging up the system um, and it's not helping. It's not addressing the root problem, which is a health problem, uh, which is a, a social problem or a lack of a lack of social infrastructure or, or, or other support. So we need to fix that. And, and again, statistically, it is, it is Indigenous and Black people who are disproportionately uh, suffering from this. So that's not due to the law itself. That's due to racist application of the law, right? Uh, it, it's in part due to the law. It, it is in part due to racist uh, application, but it's also, it, it is also just generally true that MMPs don't work. They don't have a disincentive effect. The jurisdictions that... that we're hard line in the United States, for example. Um, they're moving away from them. Uh, you know, they, they they came in under Clinton and and uh, Obama and Biden uh, began to dismantle them. And even even hard liners, the Ted Cruz's of the world, have have come out uh, critical of minimum mandatory penalties more recently. So it it, it is something that was tried and failed, uh, and it's it's time to move on. So. Just get back to the motivation of it for a second to talk about it because, yeah, I can believe you that they don't necessarily work at their justice uh, objectives. But, you know, you mentioned Clinton and Kretschner's government was like this too, which is there's a very strong difference between, and I was a consultant to the Department of Justice for many years when Alan Rock and Anne McClellan were the ministers. And so I got to know the place pretty well, worked on some controversial files with them. Uh, child support guidelines and changes to the Divorce Act and the Young Offenders Act and all kinds of things. And one of the things that people were concerned about back then is the credibility of the justice system and that people wanted to know that if you committed a serious offense, there was a serious consequence. And people didn't believe that judges were applying that and that people were that, that crime was not being dealt with, violent crime, was not being dealt with severely enough in Canada. That's where the concept between mandatory minimums comes from, right, is we're not going to have judicial discretion. If you commit a crime with a gun, you're going to jail for a certain period of time. That was a measure designed to enhance public confidence in the justice system. Is that worth considering? Uh, that That's failed. If that was the motivation at the time, and it was very sincerely held, uh, it, it has failed. The serious crime is always going to be punished seriously. And... People forget that these these sentences carry maximums, and and when the, the facts are serious, um, the person will uh, end up getting uh, doing serious time as a serious punishment. What what we're aiming at at minimum mandatories is really, I think, emphasizing one of the one of the hallmarks of the common law uh, system, which is to give the discretion to the sense of, sen uh, sentencing judge to do what is appropriate 
And, and in this case, at, at the end where it's not serious, where it's a mistake, um, you know, I, I, another example I cite based on a real case is, you know, a young indigenous guy in the north uh, has a job part-time, is going to school, has a girlfriend, um, things seem to be going in the right direction, goes out for a couple of beers on a Saturday night, takes his hunting rifle and puts a couple of, uh, of shotgun shells into an empty building. No harm, no foul, except the neighbors hear him. Neighbors hear him, they call the police. He gets charged for reckless discharge, minimum mandatory penalty, loses the job, loses the girlfriend, education done, goes to prison, ends up for four years, ends up coming out and moving in with the people he was in prison with. That's, that's the kind of thing that minimum mandatories attacks. It doesn't attack the drug dealers. It doesn't attack the, the organized crime. It, 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 those, those, for those crimes, those serious penalties are still in place and, and judges take that very seriously. So I think, I think what we're trying to do is, is just discard a policy however well-intentioned it may have been, which didn't work. And that's happening in many jurisdictions, including those hardline jurisdictions in the United States, which, in which perhaps they originated. Interesting. Thanks for that. Can I just add uh, one other thing? You mentioned Alan Rock. Uh, one of the things that this yeah, bill yeah. does as well is bring back conditional sentence orders, which is absolutely critical. Uh, Alan Rock brought them in as Minister of Justice the conservatives toned them down. Uh, we're bringing them back because they were working, uh, and they were working to help address uh, the, the problem of over incarceration. And and they were, uh, it, you can almost draw a straight line uh, in terms of the the jump in over incarceration rates when uh, MMPs were introduced and when uh, conditional sentence orders uh, were scaled back by the conservative government. So I give kudos to to Minister Rock. Uh, and for that work, and we're, we're bringing it back because it was working. Yeah, I didn't have anything to do with that. That was good. He did that himself. Okay, um, good. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do I know that's true? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so our sponsor, CN, would like to take a moment here to talk about responsible behavior during a very difficult time. We have just come through what Queen Elizabeth, bless her platinum heart, once described as an Annus Horribilis, a really lousy year. At the risk of darkening our national mood further, let me tick a few things off. Last winter wasn't just brutal, some of the coldest weather on earth. Then summer hit western Canada with some of the hottest weather on earth. Wildfires erupted. The town of Lytton in BC was destroyed, as was the adjacent First Nations community. In autumn, we learned the term atmospheric river, when so much rain fell that the city of Vancouver was turned into an island. There certainly isn't any doubt left about climate change. The past 12 months brought the third wave and the fourth wave and the fifth wave and new COVID variants. The pandemic disrupted our fragile foreign supply chains and its economic damage has been hardest on people of color and indigenous communities. So what's a good corporate citizen to do? Well, let me tell you what CN did. It soldiered on. CN complied with public health rules in all the jurisdictions where it operates. It required its workforce to be vaccinated, and its workers complied. As a result, CN trains have loaded up and rolled on time every day across provincial and international borders, moving basically everything we consume. Our shelves remain stocked as a direct result. Our domestic supply chains are rock solid. CN not only coped with extreme weather, it stepped in to help when disaster struck in BC. Furthermore, the railway has been named a top performer in reducing its carbon footprint and has taken steps to make its management and board of directors more diverse, more inclusive. CN does not regard any of this as heroic stuff. It is what I said earlier, quiet, responsible behavior and public service. Being a vital pillar of the Canadian economy is a heavy load. But you know, CN has been dealing with heavy loads for 100 plus years. Hey, when I read about the about UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on, in, on Indigenous Peoples, which Canada has signed on to, when I read about it, it's frustratingly vague to me what it means and what its implications are. Um, 
I know it's a long topic, so let's not go too far down a rabbit hole, but what are some of the obvious changes or implications of agreeing to that for Canada? Let's say it's a, let's 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 put it this way, uh, David. It's a roadmap. It's about how to do things better and how to do things together. And and if there's one single thing about UNDRIP, it is that I tell people it's a way. It, it's changing the way of thinking. So it, when we're talking about a new law, when we're talking about a new resource development project, when we're talking about whatever uh, in Indigenous policing and education, it's no longer going to be the federal government or provincial governments uh, when they when they eventually do uh, sign on to UNDRIP, it's no longer going to be the federal government just saying, here's how we're going to do it. Or we'll, it's no longer going to be the federal government saying, okay, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to consult you first, but this is how we're going to do it. It's going to be a partnership. And I think that's what's going to change at every single level. And it's already changing the way, you know, the way I am looking at these various files, uh, that I have in my mandate letter, I'm trying to do them much more uh, collaboratively, listening much more carefully and trying to work uh, together with Indigenous leadership. Um, and, and that's the thing that, that has to change. Willie Littlechild, who uh, is, I think, a hero to all of us, um, he was one of the people that helped write UNDRIP way back. He was a, a Conservative member of Parliament as well. Uh, Chief Littlechild, and he has a, a room named after him at the United Nations in New York. Um, he said, David, the difference this time is that we're now at the starting line together and we get to run the race together. And I, and I, and I, think, and I think Willie put it the best. So don't, don't see UNDRIP as uh, a series of, of defined endpoints, but rather as changing the process. And, and who knows where the process will take us, but I think after 150 years of colonialism, it can't. It, it, it's got to be better uh, using UNDRIP than it was uh, with non-Indigenous people just deciding unilaterally. Okay. So is that is that the expectation in the Indigenous community? Because I get the impression that, oh, just be blunt, I get the impression that while the government is trying to assure me that nothing big happens because of this, and it's, as you said, a roadmap, the impression that they're pretty excited about what, the consequences of this are um, and that they think it's going to bring big change. So um, are they right or are they going to be disappointed? I think they're right. Uh, it's just going to take time. I think it is going to bring big change. Uh, can't predict what those changes will be in the sense that, you know, it is a process and, but indigenous peoples will be at the table from the beginning uh, and we'll be but deciding. Sure you have an together. analysis. Surely Pardon you me. have an analysis. Surely you have an analysis, though, of various laws, practices that are inconsistent with it. Well, that's what we're doing right now. We're developing the action plan uh, in order to, you know, it's going to be in, in, in many ways prospective. How do we do things better moving forward? But, but obviously yeah. part of it is, is retrospective, looking backward and saying, OK, what laws do we do we need to change or, or, or alter? Um, and again, we're, it's a process, so we're working on that right now. We've, we have asked uh, Indigenous peoples what they think needs to be done and, and for their specific uh, uh, plans or, 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 or suggestions as to what needs to be done yeah. now. Um, we, we're just taking that in right now. So we're, in, we're in the middle of that process. We had the call in the fall, and it's coming now. Um, okay. Well, hopefully that plan will be implemented. Uh, it's supposed to be implemented within two years of passage. So we've got about another year and a half to get that done. Um, and then we'll keep pushing forward. It's going to be step by step. It's going to be incremental. But I think at the end of the day, David, that this is this document is going to be as foundational as the charter was uh, back in, in 81, 82. And I, and I think wow. it will ha have profound and profoundly positive uh, effects on, on Canadian society. I think we're finally going to live up to what we want it to be, which was a, an inclusive uh, kind of society that includes a, a variety of different Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples uh, and, and living together to build a dream. I, I honestly think it's going to get us there. And I, I'm optimistic. Um, you know, you know, from my story, I got that from my parents. So it, it is, uh, it is something that, that I'm, I'm really happy to be working on and trying to push together uh, with uh, with Indigenous leadership. Well, 
Um, while we're on Indigenous, um, over the Christmas holidays, uh, Minister Miller announced a $40 billion settlement um, on uh, dealing with um, Indigenous welfare uh, inequities as, as a result of a human rights tribunal decision, which had been litigated. Um, as the Minister of Justice, can you just tell me, because $40 billion is a lot of scratch, um, even these days. And can you tell me whether the government chose to do that settlement or whether the government was legally obligated for that to do that settlement? I, I mean, I think the answer is clear that we, we chose to do that settlement. Um, okay. Let me start at, you know, at the top and, and say that no amount of money is going to reverse the damage that's been done. Uh, systematically, you know, the there are two categories of uh, two primary categories of, of 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 kids who were affected here. One, kids who were taken from their taken from their homes, taken from their communities, um, and and placed in contexts that were uh, just not appropriate uh, to how they should they, how they should have been cared for. Hundred um, percent. And it goes with the principle that we pass in Bill C ninety two, which is Indigenous people should take care of their own kids. It's just so intuitively obvious that. It's amazing we didn't come up with it sooner. Um, the, uh, the and the, the the second class of kids are those who didn't get services because of jurisdictional infighting between provincial and federal governments and the so-called Jordan's principle kids. Um, so none of it reverses that damage. We made a decision, like as uh, like I'm putting on my lawyer hat, putting on my attorney general hat. There are I. I still think there are problems with this CHRT ruling on a legal level and. We, you know, we could have chose to, to keep fighting it, um, but we didn't. Uh, we chose to put it in abeyance. Uh, we, we launched the appeal. We immediately put it on ice uh, with the consent of the parties. And we sat down and we said, we're going to get this thing done by Christmas and we, uh, by the end of the year. And we did. Um, so we made a decision that, uh, that it needed to be settled and it needed to be settled for the sake of these kids, uh, past damages, but also Half of that money is, is, is fixing it for the future, is investing in the kinds of infrastructures and programs that are necessary so that we don't keep making the same mistake again and again. Um, so it really is a government. It, it was, a, uh, I think, a whole of government decision. Prime Minister Trudeau, obviously, uh, Mark Miller, um, uh, and, and Patty Heider and myself to push this thing, uh, Dan Vandal, to push this thing so that we, 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 we were going to do the right thing. And, and move this forward. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so, Bill 21. I don't really want to talk to you about Bill 21 because I presume I know what you think and uh, kind of know what your political strategy is. I'm interested, you mentioned that, you know, you got excited about politics because Trudeau was pushing the charter back in the 70s and up until 82 when it happened. And I'm exactly the same way. I'm a complete political child of the charter and I love it. Um, and it was one of the most exciting things to me about politics that happened. And how do we notwithstanding proof the charter? I mean, governments are starting to use this and the theory that prevailed in 1982 that it would be too politically damaging to invoke the notwithstanding clause for it to be done with any regularity has proven not to be true. And so a lot of people like me who love the charter see that as a pretty gaping hole in it. If it is politically easy to override it. Is there anything we can do about that? Well, it is look here, the, the, um, you, you recall as well as I do how it got added, uh, how it got added at the last minute uh, with, uh, you know, Pierre Trudeau, Jacques Chrétien and others um, not happy about having to add it, but feeling that they had to in order to, to get the whole thing through. Um, yeah. I, I've said publicly uh, that I, I don't believe in the preemptive use of the notwithstanding clause, that there, you know, we do have a series of rights that are protected in the charter, and we have a we have a balancing clause, section one of the charter, which allows for limitations 
in a free and democratic society. Think of the pandemic, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of restrictions that are, that are being uh, promulgated on a temporary basis in order to fight the pandemic and to protect public safety and health are, are justified in the short term through section one. So we've got that. Then we have the notwithstanding clause, which, you know, Sterling Lyon and others at the time wanted uh, because they wanted to give the last say uh, to, a, to a legislature or to parliament uh, in, in order to, to say, well, we can override these, we can override rights temporarily uh, with a sunset clause, et cetera. I, I think if you, use, if you use it preemptively, you upend that balance that was there, that is there in the charter. Um, Unfortunately, the Supreme Court of Canada in a case called Brown's, right, one of the, one of the signed decisions coming out of Quebec 20 odd years ago, <clears throat> did, said you could use it uh, preemptively. And while it, while it was rare at that point, um, it was just Quebec and I think Saskatchewan used it on, on uh, one of the Western provinces used it on some labor legislation at one point, but uh, it has now become more, um, more, more frequent. Uh, in Quebec, uh, considered in Ontario, and so I think I think we do have to think that through again. Um, at this stage, you know, we've got the Bill Twenty One litigation, uh, which which obviously I'm watching carefully. Um, it is it's not easy in the sense that, look, while I disagree with the preemptive use of, of Section Twenty One, the Supreme Court has said we can, and so it's going to it's going to take. Uh, it's going to take another court decision in all likelihood uh, to change that. Um, and it's going to take, in a, I suppose, the appropriate, uh, the appropriate context in order for a court to be uh, convinced that, that this is wrong. Um, again, it's something that I'm watching carefully as Attorney General and, uh, and will continue to move forward. Changing it constitutionally is, is quite a challenge given the amendment. So I practically, practically impossible. Do you think that maybe some sort of civics education about the charter and how it works could help restore some of the political stigma to overriding it? I mean, the reality is, to use the notwithstanding clause, you have to overtly be saying that the Supreme Court of Canada would not find what I'm doing to be reasonable in a free and democratic society. That should be politically consequential. Uh, one would think, uh, one would think, and and certainly, you know, certainly that that's that's what was thought at the time, and certainly that that's the opinion that I share, and that's that's why I think you shouldn't be able to use it uh, preemptively. But um, and and look, it's the 40th anniversary of the Charter this year, and and I, I do hope we will be able to to think about these kinds of questions in a in a more uh, rigorous way, maybe even an academic way. But, but I do think civic, civic education is not a bad thing generally. Uh, and certainly with respect to the charter, it's something that we should be proud of. And it is worth, uh, it's certainly worth uh, continuing to reinforce the messaging, that the, the very positive messaging, I think, about society that the charter sends. Well, cool. Hey, do you think we can talk about politics for a few minutes? Sure. I mean, you are uh, a, a liberal of long standing. You are um, uh, somebody that has uh, is a partisan, obviously by nature, um, and so um, given your history in the party, which is equivalent to mine, what do you? Why do you think we're at? Given the fact that we have an opposition that is in complete disarray and is verging on extremism, why are we at thirty percent? Well, look, it, it's a complex, it's a complex place out there now. When, when you and I broke in, you know, we had the Globe and Mail, we had the Toronto Star, we had, we had the Montreal Gazette, and still the Montreal Star back in those days, um, and, and other mainstream media, you know, the New York Times, the LA Times, you know, the, the, the Guardian and, and the Times in the UK, French language papers like Le Monde. And they, they were the, and, and then TV and, you know, CBC, CTV, uh, we, we had Global was just coming on stream, God world. Um, but it, it is, um, the, new, the kinds of sources for news were different and they were more, 
I don't want to say more mainstream because I, I, I do think journalists did their job and there, there were a lot, there was a lot, there was a range of opinion being expressed even in, in, in and across that media. But the internet's changed the game um, and changed the way people get information. I mean, we're all, we're all pulling stuff off Twitter and, and, uh, and Facebook and Instagram, um, TikTok increasingly. And so we're getting, we're getting little snippets, little videos, we're getting, uh, we're digesting things differently. And there isn't, uh, there isn't one source of information. And then we have the question of algorithms directing people in, in ways that um, inadvertently or advertently, uh, directing people in ways that pushes them towards sort of a confirmation bias of, of certain kinds of information that they're getting. So it's just harder, I think, uh, to get a message across. It's harder, um, harder to cover the swath of people because there are just some people, because of what they're, they're listening to or watching or what the news sources are, are never going to get your message. And so it's, it's more of a challenge. And um, we're, we're, need, we're going to need to rise to that challenge in terms of communicating. Um, I, you know, it's a, it's a common it's a common <laughs> refrain in politics. We need, we need better comms. We need better comms. Um, and we do, but boy, it's hard. And I, and I wish, uh, you know, I, I can tell you my view of what the source of the problem is, but I wish, I wish, certainly wish I had an answer to it. So I'm going to put a proposition to you and you can tell me I'm full of shit. Okay. I don't know whether it's, uh, better comms may be a consequence of different attitude. Um, I don't know whether it is the length of time in office or the pandemic, but my impression is that the government's a bit bunkered, a bit hunkered down. That, And one of the consequences of that is it's gotten defensive and it feels like you can't be part of it if you don't endorse everything about it. And at the same time, it feels like the comms is less reaching out and trying to persuade people and more just repeating a message. I'm right about this. You should do it. I just feel that. And I, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm a supporter. And I just kind of feel that attitude from the government. Rebut me. Well, look, I'm not going to say you're completely full of shit, just partly. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to say... Um, that we're completely hunkered down. Um, it is part of it's just an impression. I mean, I'm I'm doing my job. My ministerial colleagues are doing our job. We're working. We're work, we're just working at a distance. Prime Minister's doing his job. He's just in the you know over the past two weeks he's been working from home because he's been in COVID isolation. Um, so it is. We're not necessarily all sitting in parliament and question period we're not necessarily uh walking in and out and 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 being interviewed by journalists as we walk into west block um and it would be easier i think if we were uh if we were doing that it would be a whole lot easier to be seen and be visible so i think part of right. it is just the it is less visibility because of the time and because of the way we're working and yes, we're doing press releases over video. We're doing all kinds of, of things, but they don't necessarily have the same uh, level of, of penetration across a wide swath of society. Um, but it, it is also true that the, the pandemic has, has forced us all uh, internal, uh, to be a bit more internal. Um, I've listened to a lot more music in the last two years than I, I had in the previous two. Um, and, and that's true across society, so it, it increases the, the, the communication challenge. And, we're all, and add to the fact we're all sick of the pandemic, we're all sick of the restrictions, um, and you've got you know, what is a perfect storm. Yeah, yeah. Um, we got involved in politics, um, and uh, the Conservatives were led by Brian Mulroney. Now... We look back in the, at the 80s and we say that was a golden age of conservatism. And they were so enlightened back then. They were moderate. They didn't, they bought, fought back all their extreme elements. But the truth of the matter is we hated Brian Mulroney too, us liberals. And we uh, thought he was terrible. And so 
you know, the conservatives are right. They shouldn't take advice on who their leaders are from liberals because we're not going to vote for them anyway. But um, it is a different party now. It is a very different party now. And I would ask you to just sort of reflect on a couple things. A, what do you think about what's happening to that political party? And second of all, do you think our party's changed in the same way? Uh, good question. Uh, look, I, and I, I should start off with my, with my usual uh, public lauding of Mulroney on, uh, on what turned out to be uh, good policies. So the, the policy towards Nelson Mandela in South Africa, for example, I, I think... I, think I, I, I love Mulroney, but you couldn't have told me that in 87. Well, that's um, the same. That's right. And same thing, on, you know, yeah. his work on acid rain uh, was groundbreaking. Um, and in the end, the, the direction on free trade was was something that we all accepted, although I fought through the nail against it. Um, it, it is a different party now. And um, there is there is a real, uh, 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 trying to find the right adjective, there's a real populist base. And I don't, I don't want to use that negatively, but it has certain implications in North American political discourse that is uh, evidenced in in the current party, and it, it it's something that I don't agree with personally. It's it's a worldview I don't agree with personally. Um, I I want to be a progressive minister of justice, and a lot of the things that I want to do, you think about conversion therapy, uh, banning conversion therapy. There's a lot of resistance in that particular sector uh, of of the Conservative Party. That uh, that would never accept that, and so it is. It is, a, I think, a, f a force to be reckoned with. Uh, it's a it's a force that I don't agree with. It's a worldview I don't agree with. Um, it, it does it affect our party? Um, it anything that that other parties do forces us to reposition, right? And so and so it, it will always have that impact. I'm hoping. Uh, at least from where I sit, uh, that that my opposition to those kinds of policies makes me a, a better minister, makes me a better member of parliament, makes me a better liberal, um, makes me a pro more progressive liberal. But but it, inevitably, it will probably allow for a bit more room, if you will, um, on the on the so called right uh, for perhaps others to align themselves, but. I think for the most part so far we've been we've been pretty clear in our opposition to that kind of uh, those kinds of beliefs. Now, the challenge for us becomes you still have to govern, and you still have to be uh, the government for all Canadians, and you still have to be listening, even where you you perhaps strongly disagree uh, on on a worldview. Um, again, we saw with the conversion therapy where I did, did try to engage and listen to the critiques and commentaries. Uh, and suggestions, um, and you know, ended up incorporating some of them. But with some of them, the disagreement was just too fundamental. But you still have a duty to to lead. You still have a duty to listen, and you still have a duty to govern. And so that that necessarily has an impact on us. Yeah. When I was thinking about the liberals, I was thinking that uh, you know one of the reasons there's a few, but one of the reasons I didn't join the NDP, even though I was living in Saskatchewan, is that while I wanted a party that would push toward reform, as we used to call it before Preston Manning stole that phrase. Um, I felt that Canada was best served by large na national brokerage parties that tried to, uh, big tent parties that tried to bring the country together rather than ideological parties. The conservatives have completely abandoned that national brokerage role in favor of being an ideologically driven party. I feel that we've done it a bit too. I feel that we are more ideological, less of a brokerage party than we used to be. And maybe that's just the way it has to go. Maybe that's the way the system is evolving. But in times like this, it feels to me most acute in both cases. I'm not sure. Um, look, I still think I still think we're trying to be the big tent uh, brokerage party. And I agree with you on the vision. I think we get better. Um, we get better governance because of it. Um, and it it also accords well with the with the, the political system uh, we currently have. You get you get proportional representation systems in which the the the, the 
brokerage is external to the party. You get a number of small parties fixed along, smaller parties fixed along the political spectrum. They have to negotiate because of that system. In ours, the negotiation is internal to the party. And, and I think we've, we've continued to do, uh, I think, a pretty good job with that. Where, where, where uh, David, this is going to, I think, become increasing, it's already become important, but where it's become increasingly important is, this, is this, the cleavage you see across North America between rural and urban. And, and it, it really is sure. incumbent on, in, in our case, the Liberal Party, to continually be open and adaptive to rural uh, Canada. Uh, it's a different, different set of issues. Um, sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't, and we have to be sensitive, uh, we have to, be sensitive to that and try to, try to continue to build there. Um, we have some support there, but the political system is what it is. It's a first-past-the-post system. And so even if with a significant degree of support, you don't necessarily win seats. Um, it is, uh, it is uh, something that we need to continue to work at and, uh, and, and do a better job at. Yeah, I mean, in the rural prairies, we're in the single digits, right? I mean, that's not a legitimate party in, when you're at that point. Uh, so listen, I think I've saved my I've saved my most important question for last uh, for you, Minister, which is that we are the same age, almost exactly. Um, we got involved in politics at the same time. We went to law school at the same time. Okay, you went on to get a whole bunch of degrees, and so you get to be the justice minister. But I got at least one degree. Can I be a judge? <laughs> well, you, you're gonna. <laughs> I get that asked. I get that question all the time, and, and, my, and my answer is always the same. You got to apply, and you got to get past the jack. And then, uh, when that happens, uh, then the, the minister may take a look at your file, uh, depending on the needs of the courts and uh, and, and other uh, and, and what was said in the uh, the passage of uh, the, the passage of the file through that stage. Um, I'm. Uh, I, I'll be political for a second. I know you're you're trying to be funny. Um, um, and you have been, but, uh, and, and you have way more hair than I do. So that, that's, that's the other thing you forgot to mention in your Trying to be funny. That's my motto. That's good. No, I, I look, I'm pretty <laughs> proud. I'm, I'm quite proud of the judicial appointments we've made and yeah. we're, we are transforming the bench and we're making the bench look more like Canadians, uh, the, the wide variety of Canadians across the country. Still a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, that's going to be a legacy, I think, um, that, that uh, I think we can all be proud of. People should know that. People really should know that for confidence in the system, how depoliticized it's become. Because, you know, to be honest, in the 70s, if I'd asked you that question privately, you would have said, go run twice in Swift Current Maple Creek for the Liberals and carry the standard in a riding week and never hope to win and you'll be at the top of the list for an appointment that would have been the reality and that is not the reality in 2022 correct no i think that's right I, look there are still there are still some people who donate to all the political parties uh who end up getting named to the bench so you're not excluded for having donated or supported but on the other hand uh there are just so many others who are who are now being considered uh and 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 appointed uh, that have had nothing to do with with any any political party, and I think that I think we're getting uh, we're getting it to a really good place. All right, All right. give me a music reco for tonight. Um, well, I just I just got uh, the new Lucy Dacus uh, album. Um, thought some the album from late last year, and I have now yeah. forgotten the title. But go with that one. All right, I listened to it all summer already. I'll go back. Oh, to okay, tonight. okay, then we're good. Uh, thank you for this. Thank, thank you, you for David. this. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I know so much about more about you and your thinking than I did before, and I feel better for it. Thanks for doing it. Thank you, David. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been fun. Minister, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail, and thank all those hurly burlyites out there that listened to us this morning. We'll be back uh, next week. Wow.